engage your brain and enter the mind's eye. Your one-stop shop for politics to paranormal and everything in between. I'm your humble host, DJ BJ Turnoff, and you're listening to Z Talk Radio. It is March 23rd, and we're just right around the corner from April. These two months, March and April, are really a sweet spot for religious holidays. Now, both months are significant for many religions, not just the big ones. I mean, we got for Catholics, you have, of course, Ash Wednesday, and that goes all the way up to Easter with a few in between. For my Jewish brethren, we have Purim and Pesach, and for Muslims, we have Leilat El Miraj. But it really isn't just these big three religions. Many other smaller religions, for whatever reason, have important holidays in March and April. For Buddhists, we have Hindus, the Baha'i. For most religions, I guess the goal is to connect with God or some type of higher power. And for many, faith alone, that trust, that belief, that confidence that there is another world, that there is something after we die, that there is a God, is enough for many. But for me, and I think a lot of you are similar, or at least come with this perspective, that believing just isn't enough. I need to search. I need some type of something tangible. And this is where our double shot episode comes in tonight. We have two fantastic guests who are going to help us search for God, for the other world, and for enlightenment. Our tour guide in the first hour of our journey into the other world is best-selling author Freddie Silva. He is the leading researcher of alternative history, ancient knowledge, and sacred sites. He's going to reveal the radical ancient practice of living resurrection, which for more than 2,000 years before the resurrection of Jesus and the 2,000 years since has been practiced by cultures spanning both time and location. And in this ritual, initiates died and were reborn into a state of higher consciousness. And while they were in this higher consciousness, Freddie's going to tell us what secrets were revealed, where were the secret chambers and temples located where the rituals were performed, are there still any around today? Speaking of Jesus, is it possible that instead of the resurrection described by the Catholic Church, that really Jesus was possibly an initiate of this resurrection ritual? And along the way, we might even solve one of the greatest Egyptian mysteries. All this is featured in Freddy's book, The Lost Art of Resurrection. Our spiritual attunement doesn't stop there, though. Following Freddie, we have Jason Gregory, philosopher and spiritual teacher. We're going to talk about his book, Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature. We're going to take a look at the concept of enlightenment from a philosophical, psychological, and spiritual exploration. The Mind's Eye returns after a quick word from our sponsors. You're listening to Z Talk Radio. In just a few moments, when Freddie joins us, you are actually going to hear about about the possible answer to one of ancient Egypt's greatest mysteries, a culture that we're still learning so much about, just like the team of archaeologists who recently discovered a huge 3,000-year-old statue in what is now being hailed as one of the most important archaeological discoveries. And they believe the statue once stood as high as 30 feet there's still so much for us to learn about our hist- about our own history, about our world, and the worlds beyond us, which is the exact reason why the U.S. government has issued NASA a demand, get humans to Mars by 2033. And all this was passed in the NASA Authorization Act of 2017. The next two decades in space exploration are going to be phenomenal, and they are going to transform our society. Go check it out at our social media pages. We have facebook.com backslash Minds Eye Show. And check out our Twitter handle at Minds Eye Show. You'll also find us on Instagram under the same name where that gives you a bit more of a personal and visual connection to the show. The Lost Art of Resurrection with Freddie Silva when we come back on the Minds Eye. You've seen him on the Discovery Channel and BBC. Freddie Silva joins the Mind's Eye now. Welcome, Freddie. Truly, truly welcome to the show. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure's all mine. And as we said before, Freddie's dropping in to discuss his latest book, The Lost Art of Resurrection, 
Initiation, Secret Chambers, and the Quest for the Other World. Very fascinating premise, Freddie. Tell me a little bit more about it. What's the Lost Art of Resurrection? It was uh, really a project that I uh, sort of came across on my uh, my last couple of books, and essentially when I was researching the Knights Templar, of all things, I kept coming across this strange phrase that kept being uh, uttered by people about 2,000 years ago about the living and the dead, and uh, the fact that there was a living resurrection, and I had no idea what the hell they were talking about, and uh, decided to sort of go off on a little tangent, and suddenly sort of found myself discovering early Christianity, uh, the fact that there was um, Gnostic Christians and fundamentalist Christians who were attacking each other, and I thought, that's a little bit strange, I thought all these people were sort of uh, on the same boat, so to speak, and it turns out that the uh, Gnostics were actually very upset that the whole concept of uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ was taken completely at face value as an actual event, and they said, uh, it's actually quite wrong. Uh, what's happened is that you're actually confusing a spiritual truth with an actual event, and they're actually very uh, adamant that the um, resurrection of Christ actually never physically existed. It was actually a metaphor that belonged to secret mystery schools. So once I was um, pretty overwhelmed by that uh, fact, I began to sort of go back in time and see where did this tradition of initiation come from and uh, how far back uh, did it go? And it turns out that it stretches back at least 6,000 years and it literally crosses the entire globe. So the whole concept of um, the, the resurrection of the self was actually done while you were still alive on the base of the earth. And it was also considered by many prominent people, including Plato and Pythagoras and Isaac Newton, uh, to be the highest level of spiritual self-development. And I thought, wow, we have a, a very good story here. You talk, you touched on a lot, so let's let's pick apart that and, and go through each part. Let's start with the basic. Um, you said that you found this resurrection ritual that's been practiced for 6,000 years. In your research, who was the first culture, or at least that you know, that you can pinpoint who started it? It's hard to say. Uh, there are sort of echoes of uh, a culture back in Persia and the Indus region of India uh, in 6000 BC that uh, were following this concept of a god-man called Mithra. And uh, he eventually becomes a blueprint onto which the story of Jesus was grafted by the Emperor Constantine. And this is actual fact. So it must have been practiced in that part of the world. And... Um, I began to sort of bring it forward in time where we have more concrete historical records. And we reach about 3,500 BC in Persia. And yes, there um, was the cult of the Zoroastrians who were following this concept of a risen god-man. And there were, there were actual physical people who followed this, this uh, principle where they shut themselves away in, either inside a special building, a sarcophagus, or a cave, or even a mountain. And uh, they went on to this sort of out-of-body journey, uh, actually described as a near-death experience, an induced near-death experience. And uh, they were doing this for at least the best part of 3,000 years until, of course, the early Christians showed up and borrowed it from them, uh, including the Essenes. Uh, but essentially, if you go to Egypt, you also have the same story uh, in the story of Osiris. And that uh, goes back at least to about eight, if not 9,000 BC, where again, you have a concept of a risen God-man who is chopped up into little pieces by 72 co-conspirators. And it always makes you wonder why it takes 72 people to uh, uh, kill a person. So that's usually a, a sort of a, a clue that uh, you're supposed to pay attention to the story. You're not supposed to be taking it literally. And again, Osiris goes with the same concept of being chopped up into little pieces, put in the box, uh, floated down the river, and he eventually is beached on a, a, a beach in Lebanon, and he uh, resurrects himself as a, a palm tree, which then becomes the symbol of the resurrection of Jesus, uh, you know, 9,000 years later. So again, we uh, have these echoes of this story that seem to appear in different parts of the world and get picked up from culture to culture, uh, even in, uh, with, the, with the Navajo, because they have exactly the same story of a risen god-man called Esus, who gets up, um, sorry, he goes into the other world on the 21st of December, and he comes back totally alive three days later. So it's a very, very old story, and it's uh, cross-cultural. Now, I want to come back to the Jesus part. I know it's an important part of the story, and really... Now, how do you explain that you said that multiple ancient cultures were practicing this at the same time, but supposedly trade glo global trade routes weren't developed yet? How do you explain this? 
the, the latest archaeological evidence actually proves that uh, we were getting around much more than uh, we were giving credit for. I mean, we, we have uh, cultural diffusion going back at least to 8000 BC in New Zealand, where supposedly the only first people that arrived were the Maori. Well, the Maori only arrived in 1000 BC, and they say that they displaced other people who were already there. And I've just been finding out about their oral tradition. And uh, like people uh, in that part of the world, uh, like the Aboriginal culture, they have an extraordinary long memory. And uh, I was reading their oral traditions, and that they actually describe um, people who actually escaped a flood in um, the center of the Pacific. Their, their island culture sank, uh, and that they eventually used very large canoes to make their way to what is today New Zealand, and they describe them as, uh, as gods. And uh, these people got around quite a bit because their point of origin was somewhere actually in Persia. So we're talking here 9,700 BC, which is the a fairly accurate date for the, for the global flood. Um, we also have um, evidence that the Chinese were actually in California and Central America at least in 3,500 BC. Uh, we keep finding their ships, we keep finding their artifacts. So slowly the point of uh, cultural um, um, expansion is going back much, much further than we give people credit for. And it was basically a seafaring culture, uh, as you'd probably expect. Let's go into what a, a common resurrection ritual will be. Obviously, there's going to be differentiation between cultures, but I imagine there's certain patterns and themes that are at least consistent throughout them. Give us an example. They're actually quite consistent all the way uh, throughout the world, uh, and uh, it takes a bit of effort to find out the information, but it, uh, after a while, it's, uh, you, you, if you look under very large rocks, and unusual rocks, you begin to find a lot of information. Um, but the, the sort of standard blueprint is that um, this resurrection ritual, uh, in fact, is part of the initiation of joining a mystery school. Uh, it was open to anybody, and uh, the uh, people who basically had gone through the process, the uh, the adepts, they were called, um, they would go out and do public plays, they would do speeches, uh, sometimes songs, and, um, you know, people would accept them for what they were, and some people would actually begin to read the lines and get curious, and these people were allowed into an inner brotherhood, and uh, they were put under a period of observation for about a year, uh, pretty much to figure out if they had the uh, spiritual metal to uh, c conduct themselves properly and also with responsibility. Um, not because there was so much a big secret uh, that was kept within a few people, it was more the fact that this ritual is actually quite dangerous, um, because in the second and third years of the uh, initiation process, um, you were given great truths, you were given access to universal uh, concepts, uh, which required quite a bit of a mind to sort of get your head around these things. But the ultimate level of the initiation, the final level, did involve a serious fasting. It involved uh, removing as much as your physical self as possible, uh, which is why uh, the, the concept of you know, meditation and a special diet was very important. So you wanted to lighten your body as much as possible because the final stage actually involved taking a narcotic to uh, lower the level of fear to, for the fact that although you've been trained quite uh, adequately, you are about to have an induced near-death experience. So there were certain poisons that were administered to get your heart beat down to a very, very uh, low level of beat. Uh, and then what happened was that uh, you essentially went out of body, as sometimes for as much as anywhere between three and seven days, and there were people who were actually entrusted with humming around you. It's almost like they're doing a kind of a protective force field around you while you're out of body. And all this was done in a special room, a restricted chamber or a sarcophagus. And uh, after uh, three to seven days, depending on your level of uh, you know comfort of being outside of your physical self, you would then return back into the body. Uh, you were awakened by the priestesses who were the highest initiates of all and you were taken outside of this special room, placed on a mound, and the first thing you'd see would be the rising of Venus or Sirius uh, at the equinox, uh, which again is repeated uh, yet again in the story of Christianity a long time later. So that pretty much is the blueprint, um, whether you're talking to people in uh, Southwest America, whether you're talking in Peru, Egypt, uh, in even Europe, and also the Celtic countries of uh, in Ireland and Scotland. So wherever this was practiced, there were very def def definitive patterns that were shared between all the cultures. What would some of the initiates witness during this out-of-body experience? 
Well, this is the fun part, and the fun <laughs> part as well, because they were actually forbidden to talk about what they actually <laughs> saw. And of course, uh, it only makes you even more curious to find out what <laughs> That's they no fun. see. <laughs> and uh, the one thing that I learned pretty quickly was that, because um, uh, I, I mean, I was curious as well, well, why not discuss this if it was so important and so life-threatening, and you came back and you said, that was fun, I want to do that again. And a lot of them did. Uh, so they must have been getting something out of it. And the reason why they were forbidden to talk about this was very simple, as it turns out. It was because every, these people recognized that your experience in the other world was personal. And for you to describe your experience to somebody else uh, would actually color uh, their idea of what they would expect to see and in, in a certain way invalidate the experience. So actually, it was done for other people's benefit. And I thought that's actually a very charming way of looking at this. <laughs> now, from some of the surviving accounts that we have in the ancient Greek era, because they wrote about this uh, quite a lot, and Plato especially uh, wrote about it a lot, and the, the way they did it was to actually house the actual experience in a, a sort of a fictional character. So people like Plato and Homer especially, uh, in his Odyssey, he actually describes the whole experience in the actual Odyssey. You just have to read it between the lines. But one of the things that seems to become very apparent in the uh, late Greek era, when people were beginning to let the guard down a little bit, was that the fundamental idea of crossing over to the other world was to uh, extract valuable information about how nature works. And they were all very uh, uh, adamant about this. Uh, Plato went so far as to say that uh, it actually helped to shape his metaphysical views and also, um, in a way, shape his philosophical doctrine. So these people were under no um, illusion that what they were doing was not just some trip like you have, for example, when you go on an ayahuasca retreat. That's not what it was about. This was serious work, and you had to be trained to understand that your soul was going to go into the other world totally aware of what was happening. You'd engage consciously on another level of reality, and you were able to come back with specific information about the mechanics of nature. Uh, sometimes you'd actually communicate and see uh, past people who had uh, deceased, uh, talk to gods, as they call them. Uh, and you came back with valuable information about how the universe works, the actual celestial mechanics. And um, they were hinting that once you have control of this information, you could pl apply this information on a daily level in your life to a point where you can actually make uh, life do your bidding for you. In other words, you have a certain degree of control over the process of your manifestation. And that's why they held this to be a big secret. Because once you have control over the laws of nature, you can do a lot of good, but you can also do a lot of harm, which is why they took three years to observe you to make sure that you were a responsible person for this information. So anybody from the clergy, for example, that tried to break in to learn these secrets of nature, uh, they were given completely false information and they eventually weren't even allowed to actually continue the process itself, which is why I believe part of the story of uh, the Catholic Church that was uh, essentially inventing a story for Jesus and grafting him in onto the story of this old guy called Mithra, they took umbrage at this and that's how we ended up with a schism between early Christianity and the Catholic Church. <laughs> Before you mentioned that that this was a traveling into the other world, and I noticed that you don't mention the afterworld, as in like afterlife, did anyone come back with uh, in describing what the other world is like? And is there, I guess, um, a connection to the afterlife in the, in the other world as well? Um, they found the, 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 the Greeks were actually describing the fact that uh, the initiation process, uh, an initiation, by the way, means to become conscious. And that's all it means. Uh, they were very much aware that um, it, the process is very similar to actually what you experience when you physically die. It's just that in this particular case, you are crossing into another level of reality, uh, but you expect it to come back and, and continue daily life. And, uh, you know, the e Egyptian pharaohs were doing this as well, like um, Tutmosis III and Unas, uh, two famous people who um, had their own chambers, and uh, when they found their chambers, there was no one inside their sealed sarcophagi, and they're actually buried somewhere else. So these people were under no uh, uh, mistake that they actually were experiencing what it would be like to die, but the reason for doing it while you're living is that you gain a certain advantage because you're able to live your life fully aware. 
you've already understood what the other side is like, you can see the big picture of why you're here and how you relate to the big web of the universe. So in a way, it helps explain why they kept saying things like, well, you know, when you actually go for initiation and you've had this experience, you can actually approach uh, the point of physical death without any fear because you have already technically died and you are no longer afraid of death because you, all you, you know and are very much aware that you're just crossing into another room and not taking your physical body with you. Uh, and, there's, and they also added this as one of the big benefits of going through the initiation process and experiencing the other world because it suddenly removed your fear of death, in, uh, uh, your fear of anything in real life. Um, so again, a huge benefits to be gained by this experience. And any initiates who went through this process came back and said that they actually didn't experience anything at all? Yeah, they, they basically experienced... Um, you say, you say, well, do you mean uh, that... Meaning that they were they essentially that they never had an out-of-a-body experience, a, a near-death experience. Pretty much either nothing happened to them. Yeah, I mean, nothing really sort of untoward happened to them. And in fact, uh, there were uh, sort of checks and balances uh, all along the way. In fact, the priests that were actually in charge of administering the poison and the narcotics, um, they had to go for a huge process of preparation to make sure that they got this right, because uh, even as we know today, you know, a, um, a sort of a 4% dose of arsenic can be quite beneficial under certain circumstances, but a 9% dose will kill you. Uh, so they had this understanding of uh, actual, uh, and a, a great training of making sure that uh, the experience is very valid and also everything was done in a very correct way. But um, the big uh, takeaway from what some of the initiates had said, and uh, actually bothered to write this down, and there's not many of them, uh, like I said, this was a, a secret process. Many of them did see the huge benefits that it gave them a bigger uh, view on life. They came back much more aware uh, of themselves, their position in the world, the importance of their journey. So in other words, you conduct yourself with much more uh, confidence in the world. And this also helps us to understand why in the early Christian era, and certainly around that time frame, uh, we start hearing about the initiates who've gone through the process calling themselves the living, and everybody else who had not gone through the process as the dead. Uh, in other words, they were described mm. ordinary people as being you know, totally unaware of another level of reality beyond the physical world, and uh, they basically bookended their life you know, with disease, fear, pain, uh, attachment, and that these living, uh, they call themselves the living because they could see better, they, could, they were truly alive in their, in their body because they'd already seen and experienced the all that there is in the universe. So it made them feel, in a certain sense, uh, not superior, but certainly much more self-empowered to live their life very consciously. And I think that made the, the difference not just uh, back then, but also today. I think we need this sort of understanding today more than ever, I think. It sounds like a very positive experience, but what about negative experiences? The only one that I remember reading about uh, was when there was a... Um, a Greek philosopher who actually tried it, and uh, he said that, that at the beginning, uh, and I don't even know if this even qualifies as a negative experience, uh, it's almost that he actually describes the um, approach at the gates of the other world as being really quite horrifying. He said that you see dismembered things, nothing makes any sense, the, the colors are overwhelming, sounds are alien to what you experience in real life. And uh, you, it, it, they felt a certain trembling, uh, and I'm going to quote this directly, as they approached the jaws of death, but then suddenly they remembered their training as they're leaving their body, and they sort of centered themselves, and they realized once you sort of walk past this, uh, this sort of tunnel, and a lot of them describe it as walking a bridge over a river, um, once you sort of cross this bridge over a river and you, uh, you, know, you fail to be sort of seduced by all of these negative and fearful images that you're getting that are so contrary to normal life. Um, they talk about a place of bliss, a sort of a paradise, a paradisical landscape where everything is just extraordinary, where color is beyond um, the human comprehension, sounds are much more uh, subtle, and suddenly you can almost see things in four dimensions, and they're, and they're approached by a sense of awe. 
So the only negative thing that I ever heard that survives, every account that survives, uh, was really to do with the approach, um, the, first, the initial approach when they are leaving the body before they cross this bridge of separation, as they called it. And, uh, and that was also part, again, of why it took you three years to go through this exceptional training so you actually don't get seduced and you uh, by these, um, what they describe, negative forces. But it's more a sort of a fear of the unknown, I think is what they were trying to describe. Things that uh, don't really have any shape or any reference in the in real life. And if you can just sort of get beyond that stage, then you're fine. And uh, that's about the only sort of almost negative experience I can think. Everything else is very much a very positive experience uh, to the point where even Pythagoras went back seven times and did it. In your opinion, Freddie, is this, and the experiences that they're having, that initiates they're having, is it in? Is it just in the brain, or is this actually happening? Oh, it's actually happening, uh, and this is where I began to uh, examine the um, the concept of shamanism versus this uh, out of body experience, uh, and uh, there are parallels between the two. Uh, and the parallels are that you're training yourself to have a certain out-of-body experience. Now, with shamanism, and this really depends on your understanding of shamanism. I mean, there is shamanism, which where you sort of do train for six months, you go into the middle of Central America, you have a very good teacher, and you do it properly. Uh, and that's about as close as you get today to the living resurrection experience. And then there's shamanism, which is the weekend shaman that flies out to the Amazon to have a drink of ayahuasca, see visions of very brightly colored objects, uh, and then you come back and you go back to your everyday life. Um, that's not the same thing. Um, we're talking about here about uh, an experience where you actually leave the body as though you're actually uh, clinically dead. And in fact, you actually are virtually comatose. And uh, you have a completely real experience of what it's like to be on another level of reality and come back to tell about it in excruciating detail. Uh, shamanism isn't quite like that. Shamanism kind of uses the drug to induce visions. Uh, and, and in a certain way, you are sort of experiencing an altered level of reality, but not to the same degree as the living resurrection experience uh, was described by initiates. This is something completely different, uh, pretty, pretty much as, you know, you and I are having a conversation right now. Uh, it's a real experience. Um, uh, a low level of shamanist experience would be a sort of a simulation of what we're, what we're experiencing right now. Does that make sense? On a level, sounds a, a bit matrixy in a, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> now, I, I got to admit, you know. I mean, yes, and now that you bring that up, I mean, yes, I think the uh, the concept of Hollywood and the Matrix actually is a very good uh, example uh, where you literally think that, you, I mean, you were watching this film of what they we think is, is a sort of, sort of a, a hallucinatory pro, uh, process that Nero is experiencing, but actually, he is actually having the experience, so it does require a certain amount of suspended disbelief uh, when you're actually having the real life experience. Uh, and um, But it can't be really uh, be confused with just a visionary experience, which is totally different. Uh, that happens inside your, your head, and then to a certain degree, that uh, def um, def it kind of depends on your level of belief of where your consciousness goes when you're having this sort of visionary experience. Because, I mean, in my, ex in my uh, experience, I do believe that even while we're having visions, we are tapped into another level of reality. But the actual initiation process is much, much different. It's very real, it's very physical, because it treats the soul as an actual entity, and the soul is in complete control. Hmm. Well, let's keep going with the pop culture connections there for a moment. Uh, you know, reading through the rituals, a lot of it had to do with sensory deprivation as a way to uh, induce an advent body experience as, as part of the ritual. Uh, and I can't help but think about you know, the movie Altered States, and then even recently, uh, I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix, called Stranger Things. Have you seen that at all, by any chance? I haven't seen it, though. Uh, okay, wonderful. Well, they, you know, there's a whole... Oh, you should definitely check it out because it actually has uh, you know a little bit about sensory deprivation. I mean, they introduce that pretty quickly. Uh, but And part of that is that while during this time of the sensory deprivation, they do travel to this other world as part of it as well. Uh, did any initiates of that talk about anything paranormal, maybe supernatural creatures that they encountered? Only on the way to the actual bridge of separation where you actually cross into this paradisical landscape. Um, they do t uh, describe uh, unusual uh, creatures. Uh, they don't really go into huge detail uh, because they're not, they weren't allowed to. I mean, in uh, ancient Greece, uh, you're even put in jail.
jail if you described what you'd actually seen as part of your initiation, which is quite a, as extraordinary. It was actually a criminal offence to describe your initiation. Um, but no, it was very much just the fact that uh, the, uh, the only unusual things that they seemed to have experienced was just the fact that they were dealing at the fir- in the first few minutes of the experience. Um, they were looking at things which they could not have any uh, reference if, uh, in real life. So that's what created a, a certain panic, that, that there were you know, dismembered people or things which seemed to be uh, almost you know, people who were actually physical and yet you could see through them, for example. You could see all the veins in their bodies because you, you know, your, your soul is getting used to being outside of a physical vessel. It's crossing into another frequency. So it's kind of like you, you're uh, turning the dial on the radio station you're going from 88 FM to 90 FM, and in between you get static, and and that static can be a little bit unnerving until you find that right balance where you suddenly get music again. And I think that's what they were trying to basically describe in the experience, that it wasn't so much negative, it was just uh, sort of uh, alarming because they had no reference for it, and your soul also had no reference it while it was living in the, in the physical body. Let's take a quick break there. When we come back, Freddie Silva is going to go into how Jesus, Knights Templar, all your favorites fit into this subject. And, of course, the Freemasons. We'll be right back on The Mind's Eye. We're back on The Mind's Eye with Freddie Silva talking about his excellent and very fascinating book, The Lost Art of Resurrection. You seem pretty convinced that all this is real. I got got to know, Freddie, are you an initiate? Have have you actually went through this ritual, this process? Would you even tell us? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have, but not to the degree that the full initiation practice was described. I mean, I haven't been taking three years of my life to uh, you know, get initiated, even though I obviously I know a lot of the material because obviously I've written so much about it. Um, I haven't actually haven't induced any of that experience, but I can say, hand on heart, uh, and I actually didn't uh, I, I didn't sort of research this before I actually had the experience which for me is actually um, very validating I don't go out looking for something in order to have the experience I appear to have the experience and then go and say well what was that all about and then research it so it's not psychosemantic uh, which for me is actually quite useful because I like to uh, write from a certain middle of the road point of view and a lot of people that um, have read my books understand that I'm trying to come at this without my own personal opinion I'm trying to show facts, and uh, I'll let you figure out the truth uh, from that point of view. In other words, it's just my point of view, and it's no use. So um, there have been a couple of times in my life where I have experienced something extremely similar. And, uh, and again, I wasn't looking for these things to happen. I didn't even know if these things were even possible. Uh, one of them was um, I was actually inside the Great Pyramid and, um, of Giza with uh, three other people who do similar work. And um, we were in there to try and just sort of clean the place up. Um, I was to cut a very long story short. I work with a, a quiet group of people in uh, in England who go about uh, sacred sites, cleaning things up, you know, the mess that people leave behind. And it's usually to do with emotional stuff or energetic stuff. Uh, people do tend to misuse sacred sites and it leaves a certain energetic imprint. So it's up to us to clean the place up so that next people afterwards can enjoy it properly. And there are many groups like us around the world. And um, one of these moments was to go into the Great Pyramid and uh, we had the King's Chamber to ourselves uh, without having to pay for anything. This was during a normal visiting hour. And suddenly we found ourselves alone and in complete darkness. There was no light. And uh, we were just tuning in the, in the chamber. And suddenly uh, I found myself surrounded with about 33 rather tall people dressed in the most wonderful uh, white satin just just literally came out of the stones and surrounded us and I thought this is really interesting and it was the most extraordinary experience I mean there's no fear I, I felt completely uh, protected by these people and there was a certain amount of respect and um, after the experience which lasted about 20 minutes uh, the lights came on we all went outside and there was four guys which is very unusual uh, it's usually a mixture of women or just women alone and um, four guys actually looked at each other and it's quite clear that we're trying to explain something without being losing our manly cool. <laughs> and uh, I just remember saying, you know, did, 
did somebody see what I saw up there? And the first the guy said, yeah, I saw these people coming out of the stones. I mean, it's like we had this out-of-body experience. I don't even remember what we did for the last 20 minutes. So for those 20 minutes, we had crossed over between one physical plane and another, and it's, it's something that stuck with us. Um, but even earlier than that, back about 15 years ago, uh, my God, is it that long already? Uh, <laughs> I was researching the crop circle phenomenon in England, and uh, I remember um, one year, and I believe it was in 1997, where I was actually very close to figuring out the truth behind the real crop circles, and I thought, I'm going to go and meditate inside one of them because I'm missing a valuable piece of information. And I actually had, uh, an, I was actually taken out of body. I, I was actually levitated above the ground, uh, and I wrote about the whole experience in my first book. Um, and uh, when I came back, and it took exactly 45 minutes, and I know this, because I had a cassette tape uh, playing with me in the middle of the field. Uh, if anybody is younger than 30, you'll have to Google cassette tapes. <laughs> um, and uh, the tape, I had the, the tape click, and I hit the ground with such a thud, I had a, an actual bump on the back of my head for several days just to prove that I had been uh, levitating and I was taken out of body, uh, completely immersed in this underworld reality. Uh, well, again, with the same people that I saw later on in Egypt, and I'm not the first person to even describe this, but I do remember being encased in exactly the same experience that these um, initiates had done in the old days, that you'd crossed over another level of reality. Everything is hyper-physical, uh, hyper-sensitive. Um, a, a color and a sound which is just so pure and hard to describe. But again, meeting unusual people, uh, coming back with extraordinary information, which then be becomes the basis of my first book. And uh, I, I always have to say, hand on heart, that most of that stuff was, seems to have been channeled because I don't know where this stuff came from. I just had to go back and prove that, that the information was true, and sure enough, it was. So uh, to answer the question, yes, I think I have had a glimpse of what it's like to cross over and then return with specialist information, and pretty much as a way that uh, Plato had described it. Uh, with that tape that you were just talking about uh, while you had that, that last experience, uh, did you, I imagine you, you probably listened to it fairly promptly after the experience. Did you hear anything, any weird sounds, a anything, you know, out of the usual? Uh, I was actually, I actually taken the, uh, this cassette recording to the field as a, um, with a bit of music in the background just to soothe me, which is kind of interesting. Ah, gotcha. In, in a true initiation setting, you'd have been taking a narcotic, you know. Right, right. Not to get you high. Uh, it, the narcotic was used to calm you. Uh, that was the difference. Uh, I, 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 and unwittingly, I'd done exactly the same thing because when you're lying in the middle of the field in England at uh, midnight and you can't see your hand in front of you, it can be a little bit unnerving, so I figured I'd just take this tape, and it was, um, it, actually, I, I don't remember what it was, it was by John Seary, a good friend of mine, uh, designed some wonderful soundscapes for planetariums, and I just had a tape, that music with me, so I wasn't actually recording uh, the event. Obviously, these experiences uh, and these rituals, they were conducted in, in certain locations, uh, secret chambers and temples, uh, and before you were talking about your experience in Egypt, so... Let's make a connection there. You talked uh, in the book, you mentioned how, well, you supposit a, a certain theory about an empty sarcophagus. Talk about the, that, uh, what, the stand, you know, what the given story is and, and what you supposit. Well, it's the biggest uh, confrontation between uh, orthodox archaeology and any open-minded person, and that is that um, they call so many of the pyramids and chambers uh, in, in Egypt and throughout the rest of the, the ancient world as being burial places. Uh, and that really comes from a, a sort of a misguided Victorian view, because the Victorians uh, were looking at all of these friezes and uh, admitting that you know, the Egyptians appeared to have been having this extraordinary... Um, ability to go on and on and on and on about the dead. They were totally obsessed with the dead. But what they failed to see and failed to understand, uh, mostly because they didn't consult any of the local people who obviously knew much better than, uh, you know, than Europeans, um, that these things were supposed to be met as metaphors. The visuals were metaphors. You weren't supposed to be taking them literally. There are different levels of interpretation. Uh, so we stuck with that idea that all of these places were burial places. But the problem is, in uh, many, many cases, and specifically with Egypt, there is no body present. Now, if, there, if you look at the sarcophagi, uh, and let's take Tutmosis the third sarcophagus as a great example, um, these things would have cost a fortune to carve back then. Uh, and in the case of uh, Tutmosis III's um, burial chamber, or so-called burial chamber, 
the pharaoh was never, never found inside it. Um, the building was found sealed. Uh, it's in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, it's unusually aligned, and it also has a well, which is a very unusual feature for a dead person. A uh, dead person don't, don't have to have a drink, and there's a well in there. Um, there's this beautiful sarcophagus that was found in a sealed chamber, and yet when they uh, opened the sarcophagus, there's no body inside. In fact, Tutmosis had actually uh, created himself a, a, an actual funerary chamber about uh, two miles away in the uh, Valley Temple of Hatshepsut, and that's where his body was found. And it was the same thing uh, with two other pyramids, and also the Pyramid of Unas, and that's where we get the big connection, because the thing that links Tutmosis III and Unas um, uh, chambers is the fact that both pharaohs were found buried elsewhere, that their um, secret rooms were found sealed with nobody inside it, and also that the two buildings were covered head to toe in the most wondrous, uh, wondrous um, uh, descriptions of life in another level of reality, but it also shows, and specifically with the uh, Unas chamber, that the um, pharaoh has been shown to have left the body and has reached the other world very much alive, and is expected to return back to his living body and carry on as before. And this was usually done, this initiation was technically done on the 13th year of a pharaoh's reign. So Unas was not the only person that was, uh, you know, had this special room made under his own pyramid where he had this out-of-body experience, and I'm sure many others also had it too, because there was a, a spirit door that was found in that chamber that actually talks about one person, uh, it was a servant in his household, uh, who describes his astonishment at uh, having been allowed to, to, and I quote, master secret things of the pharaoh, and that he was admitted into this secret chamber, and that uh, eventually, after describing his other world experience, he says, and after that, I came, out, I came back and I found the way. Now, that is a very important statement, because the way uh, is actually found in 3,500 BC in China with the gentlemen of the way, and they uh, are doing exactly the same um, experience, except that they weren't using a sarcophagus. They were using an actual chamber, whether natural or man-made, we don't know, inside a special sacred mountain. And they said that when they came back out after three days of being out of body, they found the way. Now, this is important because we find that quote three and a half years later in the time of Jesus being used by the Essenes, who were members of the way. So th these people who followed the way essentially are describing the initiation process because in China it was called Tai Yi, uh, or what we call today the Tao. And uh, that is one of the basic principles of the initiation process. So we're talking again about these secret rooms and secret chambers where it was specifically designed uh, and, uh, for people to have this outer body experience. And as you actually pointed out quite uh, uh, earlier, Brian, um, it was a sensory deprived environment. Nothing was allowed to distract you or your soul from the actual experience. So this is the reason why they were often put under, deep underground or specially sealed or built out of very big rocks. It was literally to make sure that there was no distraction and also to shield any uh, outside electromagnetic forces, uh, which we know today to be, uh, uh, these chambers do have a very different frequency inside. And it does mean that it puts you in a certain state of receptivity uh, in your subconscious state in order to have an out-of-body experience. So we're talking about very deliberately designed environments to allow you to have this out-of-body experience. Why do they call it the bridal chamber, or at least that seemed to be called very often, or it's referred to as? Yes, I wonder that too. I kept coming across the reference to the bridal chamber. The last uh, portion of the experience was that the initiate has to go and marry a bride or go into a bridal chamber. And I thought, who is this woman? And uh, how come she's never described or around? And it took quite a while before I sort of read... Uh, stories going all the way through Indonesia, through uh, Asia, through India, Egypt, uh, and certainly the Middle East and Greece, uh, and, and even Ireland. Um, and I began to realize that what all of these initiates were doing when they had this out-of-body experience and they crossed into the other world and returned is that they married a divine bride. And that's when the penny dropped, uh, that these people are marrying the, uh, a woman who's actually not physical at all. Uh, it was their way to personify the marriage with with nature and with ultimate wisdom. And the ancients, almost without exception around the world, 
always described the source of all wisdom in the universe as being embodied in a divine bride or a divine virgin. And again, we see vestiges of that in the very early Christian doctrine as well. Uh, and of course, Mary Magdalene being the ultimate portrayal in the physical world of that divine bride. And it, as it turns out, um, when you actually look at uh, many of the practices in the Middle East, uh, and I'm talking about here in 2,500 BC, it was actually the women who had the highest level of access to these chambers. They were the ones who actually personified the, uh, the physical embodiment of this divine bride. So the, this woman was someone who actually, um, she, uh, the, the, these initiates married a divine bride because they're literally uh, marrying divine wisdom, the knowledge of everything that there is. And uh, the concept even eventually uh, works its way around to the Templar uh, ethos, where they too married this divine bride. And if anybody's even familiar with the Arthurian legend, of course, there's the whole story behind that, where uh, you know Arthur and his wife, and she goes off and uh, uh, disappears with uh, another knight. And of course, he married a divine bride. So anybody that was following this particular uh, story and the initiation in the Middle Ages, the, uh, the story was was written as a fiction that describes how the knight is always chasing this uh, beautiful damsel in distress in his tower. And that was their way of describing their initiation process uh, of marrying the divine bride in a way that wouldn't actually hurt the actual teachings. Now, obviously, there's the argument that King Arthur obviously didn't exist and then ties in because I was just reading CNN just posted how Jesus possibly didn't exist. How does that play into here? Let's go into that a little bit more. Arthur was essentially a composite king. He was part real and part myth. And pretty much the same way that um, people in Central America uh, also are Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, who, of course, um, is a story about the uh, this god-man that goes into the sacred cave or the mountain on the 21st of December, uh, goes into the other world, comes back three days later as a feathered serpent. Now, that's part of the myth. That's the symbol that uh, basically the initiate is trying to follow. Now, it turns out that when you're actually following in this initiation process, if you actually do um, go through the process and you come back and you become, a, become an, an adept, a full initiate of the resurrection mystery, you actually become a, an earthly embodiment of that mystery. So throughout the, uh, the, the history, we do see uh, real people, physical people, who've taken on the embodiment of Osiris. People have taken on the embodiment of a Mithra or a Jesus. They're literally following an, an archetype. And uh, to uh, the same degree, uh, Arthur was doing the same thing. Um, he was a, 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 you know, he was a real uh, character, uh, but he was also following a myth, and that's where the confusion exists. Um, and part of the confusion is the fact that um, the story is actually Welsh. Um, we just seem to be sort of putting him in a different uh, part of the world, like in England, because you know the English eventually uh, moved. Well, they kicked the Welsh out of England, and um, but the Welsh were there long, long before they were the indigenous culture. So the Welsh already had this story. Uh, so if we're looking for Arthur, we really, we need to find him in Wales. Uh, and uh, in the Welsh language, Arthur, which is the original name, actually uh, means the great bear. Now, in every single uh, part of the world, when you're going for the initiation uh, concept, depending on which time period you're talking about, each of these people are also associated with a specific constellation in the sky that is prominent in that era. And it just happens that in the uh, 4th and 5th century, when the real Arthur was supposed to have lived, it was the Great Bear constellation that was prominent in the northern sky. So there's, again, another overlap. So these stories have to be seen in layers, in metaphors, but partly uh, they're also uh, real people. And there are also real people in the Central America that also went through the initiation process and they came back and named themselves Quetzalcoatl. So again, it's confusing until you understand that uh, when, a, when a physical person takes on the, um, the process and has become the process, then he or she can take on that name as part of their heritage. The most controversial part of, of the book is the Jesus Christ part. And before you mentioned that possibly his actual resurrection didn't happen that it, it, it's most likely that it's really this uh this this art of resurrection just to clarify that statement do you think that jesus was real was a real person yeah absolutely uh, there's no doubt about it um and yeah i mean i mean i, I should also sort of fra uh, frame the um 
the question by saying that you know, I was raised as a Catholic. Uh, I don't <laughs> good practice, that, good practice. Uh, I believe in early <laughs> Christianity, which is much more pure and actually much more aligned to Buddhism. And in fact, uh, all of those things, all of those cultures and, and the religions are pretty much all the same. They're following the same blueprint. Um, and I asked the same question as well, because obviously um, this is where the book really began. And uh, I began to do a lot of research into early Christianity, and I was... Um, I'm not even sure what the phrase is, appalled uh, to discover that early Christians were actually appalled at the way that fundamentalist Christians had taken the story of Jesus completely, literally, and taken the whole thing out of context. So it required quite a bit of understanding and getting your head around this to what you've been taught. And uh, once you begin to realize and read a lot of the um, Gospels that were banned, you begin to realize that's why they were banned, because they talk about, uh, and specifically the uh, Gospel of Thomas and Philip, which were very damning, uh, Thomas, of course, being the brother of Jesus, and he has some extraordinary uh, quotes in his uh, in his book because he talks about how, you know, anyone who uh, thinks that uh, the the body can die and come back from the dead is a fool. He's an idiot, and uh, he really gives uh, fundamentalist Christians a really hard time. And uh, he was very adamant, along with uh, Philip, that you know one has to actually experience the uh, the living resurrection while they live, and when they die, if they have not experienced the living resurrection, when they die, they'll get nothing. They'll be completely lost. And I thought, now that's a very interesting way to look at this. So they actually did uh, show Jesus as being a real person, as being an initiate, and he was of the school of um, John the Baptist, who was even, an even more fascinating character, actually. And uh, it turns out that um, Jesus never actually wanted to start a religion. He was really just following a very old tradition, and of course that tradition is the story of Mithras, which is the Persian story of the risen God-man. And if you actually look at the story, uh, the original story of Mithras in the Middle East, and uh, you'd be astonished how uncannily identical it is to the story of the, the official story of Jesus. And of course, uh, historically, what happened was that Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, uh, he was being forced by the Catholic Church to appoint Jesus into a into a god. Now, Jesus uh, never said that he was a god. Uh, no one else even said that he was a god. They all claimed him to have been a real man. Even the Quran admits this, and they're very and they're very uh, respectful of Jesus, by the way. Uh, which will shock a lot of right-wing people, but there you go. Um, <laughs> these are all facts. Um, but Constantine, well, he was getting a little bit fed up. Um, if you read the, the story of his life, he was getting a little bit fed up about this pushing because he had been following and worshipping Mithra all his life. And uh, eventually, just to sort of be left alone to carry on his life, he said, look, okay, fine, let's make Jesus into a god. Uh, we'll just take the story that I know so well of Mithra and we'll take his uh, his name out and we'll put Jesus' the story in. Now, again, this is not an opinion. This is an actual fact. So if you care to look at the actual story of Mithra and then compare the story of Jesus, you'll see that, that they are identical, uh, right down to the people that witnessed the, the miraculous birth. And this is why the early Christians were so annoyed about um, the fundamentalists, is because they completely took a, a spiritual truth and they turned it into a real event, and the two are not the same thing. Now, this brings us to the most important part of the question is, how do we account this with the actual crucifixion? And I had a bit of a problem with this myself, until I came across the work of a wonderful uh, theologian and uh, a historical researcher called Michael Bajant, who died recently. And he wrote some fabulous books uh, because he had some extraordinary access to um, real evidence and uh, first-hand information that was written uh, back at the time of Jesus that has been suppressed by the church, and for good reason, from their point of view, that the what happened was, and if I'm going to try and paraphrase his work correctly, I hope I am, um, he uh, uh, discovered that what had happened was that Pontius Pilate never wanted to crucify Jesus because Jesus had broken no Roman law, and the only people that could be crucified were people who had broken the Roman law. So there was a problem here, and that's what uh, Michael was looking at. He said, well, how do we uh, uh, reconcile the story that we had been told, because apparently there were so many witnesses? Well, what happened was that uh, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Jesus' uncle, had made a deal with Pontius Pilate and the authorities. Uh, he was a very high-ranking official back in the day, and he said, look, um, the Jews want him dead. You want to make this matter go away. Why don't we leave you with me, and we'll see to him that there is a public execution, and don't ask any more questions. And he said, okay, that's, I'm fine with that. Make the whole thing go away. 
So what happened was, according to Bajan's research, and it is very meticulous, by the way, uh, he said that the um, the actual crucifixion was done on uh, Joseph of Arimathea's property, and the nearest eyewitnesses to this event were over a quarter of a mile away. And anyone who's been in that part of the world knows that in that heat, you see this anything a quarter of a mile away, you can you can't figure out what's going on because of the shimmer of the heat that comes up from the actual dust. And uh, what happened was is that they apparently uh, they, they didn't nail the guy to the cross. They just basically um, roped him to the cross. He was given an, an an anesthetic like a poison administered by a woman who knew the art of poison and how to administer it. And she, of course, was named Mary Magdalene. And that's what this whole story of the vinegar and the sponge dip in the vinegar was all about. Because she knew how to induce a near-death experience. And then when they took him down, because uh, no one actually saw the guy being taken down, he was put inside a, uh, a sealed chamber. Three days later, he's gone. Because, and she was, of course, Mary Magdalene was the first witness to this. And of course, the church, this is where the fundamentalist church and the Christian church are totally opposite to each other. Because the official story is that the apostle, Peter, was the first to see Jesus, and that is absolutely not the case. It was Mary Magdalene who was the first to see Jesus, and this is hidden, written in the uh, Gnostic Gospels, which is why they were banned. And of course, she was the first to see him because she was the one that was entrusted with all of these narcotics, and she knew the antidote to what she'd given him. So three days later, she gives him the narcotic, he comes back into real life, and from there, we can speculate uh, what the Indians said, that uh, Jesus would not have a nice, healthy life living in India until he was age 80. Uh, and on that point, I really can't say anything because it's not my special sort of research area. But I do find Michael Bajan's argument and research uh, very convincing from that point of view. And we can see that there's a two-sided story to this whole thing. Uh, that there was a kind of crucifixion, there's a sort of a mock crucifixion, and then the resurrection was taken for what it was. Jesus literally was uh, revived from a near-death state. I mean, I'm just kind of sitting here stunned, saying that uh, Jesus lived out a full life afterwards, uh, up till 80 in India, of all places. It's, um, it, it hasn't been proved, but people <laughs> in India, and I believe it's in Uttar Pradesh, um, that there is a grave there, and the locals, if you ask them, and so is we understand that Jesus is buried here, and they just shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, it's been, it's been here for 2,000 years, and we're surprised that no one's asked. Uh, for them, well, it's no big deal. They consider the guy to be an important teacher and nothing more than that. Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus was saying about himself. He's not a god. Uh, in fact, it brings us to the wonderful phrase that he was the son of God. Um, actually, when the Catholic Church gave him that epitaph, it actually revealed his highest grade of initiation. Uh, you had four grades. When you first went into the initiation schools, you were a son of a woman. When you graduated, you graduated as a son of a man. And if you went on to the next level, you were a, a son of the gods. And uh, a, a man who has actually gone into the bridal chamber, gone for the resurrection ceremony, crossed into the other world, returned risen, uh, metaphorically speaking, and has reached the level of adept, he has now become a son of God. So there's four stages, and it helps us to understand a lot of these misplaced uh, uh, phrases in the Bible, and it actually starts to give the Bible some kind of sense. Why would Christianity want to change it from a real practicing ritual of resurrection to just saying it was uh, an actual resurrection of death? This is where it gets a little bit tangled because it depends on your point of view. Uh, one could argue that uh, there was a, a, a patriarchal uh, a religion about basically being imposed on people, and yes, there was. Uh, I mean, we can just check the historical facts. And there was a group of men who wanted to take over the, uh, the whole control of the religious belief of Europe uh, after Rome had completely collapsed. Uh, so these uh, people were under no... Uh, uh, impression that uh, women were not supposed to be part of this process because up to that point the women were actually the highest initiates of the mystery schools they were very very important they didn't want any of that so that's why they made Peter the head of the Roman church despite the fact that Peter had never been part of the Roman church and the documents that uh, show that he was were shown later to have been completely false and um, they, were, they were forgeries so the whole basis of the church is based on a bunch of lies and forgeries so that's one part of the argument um, the other side of the argument uh, is the fact that they uh, whoever it was that was looking at these initiation secrets was not allowed further than the front door 
again, the first level of initiation was to judge your level of responsibility and your ability to keep a certain uh, amount of information secret because you didn't want uh, some of these things to go out into the public because they could be misused against the general public. I mean, if you understand the laws of nature and how to control them, uh, you can do a lot of damage. And the uh, in mystery schools knew about this. They were very serious about this. There's a certain pain of death that you entered uh, into an oath of, uh, of uh, allegiance into these schools. Uh, so I think, uh, from my personal point of view, is that uh, this, uh, and I tend to sort of favor the second point a bit more than the first, is that someone's nerves was taken out of place because they were not being given access to the true mysteries of what was being said. They were understanding things on the literal level. They knew that there was another level because word had been spreading that uh, Jesus was doing some miraculous things, but we don't know how. Uh, they wanted to know this. They wanted power. And the priestly caste at that time historically was after power as a method of control. So because the initiates did not give away this power, that set up a confrontation. And I think that's where the schism really, really happened. It was really a matter of uh, a group of guys who wanted uh, the uh, information and they were not being given information. So they turned on these people because the one thing that I found very uh, uh, puzzling was why was the church eliminating, in fact, they were massacring people by the tens of thousands who disagreed with them. And I thought, what was it that they were disagreeing with with church dogma that made them you know, hunt people to, uh, to, on, on this massive purge? And when I began to look at the different sects of that period, um, and including uh, uh, Islam as well, because this also comes into the equation, all of these other sects, 99% of all these sects, they all agreed on the same thing. That uh, one, God is not exterior, it is an interior process. Two, you can access God at any time without going for an intermediary. And three, the most uh, easiest way to do it is go for this initiation process where you do understand that there is another level of reality. You can access it at any time under a control level and you are totally self-empowered. This is anathema to any religious concept that uh, we have whereby power is held in the hands of a few people that you have to talk to if you want to talk to God. These factions are completely dogmatically opposed to each other. And that's what all of these people had in common, and that's why they're all eliminated. They all shared these things in belief, including Islam, by the way, uh, which actually helped Jesus to be a very high initiate, a very important person, but not a god. Uh, and they're very adamant about this, and they do it with respect. So to have the early Christians and the um, uh, the Muslims and every other sect in the Middle East in total agreement, despite the fact that they had their you know obvious uh, differences, but they still respected each other, that's the one thing that bonded them against the Catholic Church. What, let's let's move along. Uh, I don't know a few thousand years and uh, <laughs> bring it back to present day. <laughs> <laughs> now, what turned me on. To me, to this story, because uh, as a Freemason, I mean, a lot of it uh, sounded somewhat familiar. Well, very much so. In fact, uh, it's uh, it's interesting to see how history has a wonderful way of sharpening people's ability to survive. Uh, back then, in uh, you know, 1000 to uh, BC, right after the time of Christ, uh, you stand, you stood up for your beliefs, and um, depending on where the uh, sword fell, uh, you tended to die and die horribly. And uh, it was a matter of pride. I mean, you would you took the secrets with you to the grave because it would be disastrous to allow anyone to have this specialized information uh, and give it to the wrong and put it in the wrong hands. So they would rather die than give it away. So you know, a thousand years later, we had a Templar showing up. Who essentially, when you look at the Templars and the Essenes, they're the same people. They even dress the same way, and they had the same rules and the same access. They had an outer brotherhood. They had an inner brotherhood. Um, they gave away all of their money to put into escrow for the group. Uh, they followed the, a vow of uh, committal to one person, not of chastity, but the committal to one woman, or a man, if, if that's your inclination. Um, so they basically were following the old principle of reviving original Christianity, which is why they were, the Knights Templar never followed Jesus. They, they, they respected the guy, but for him, uh, for them, he wasn't important. The important person was John the Baptist. And of course, when you follow the John the Baptist tradition, now you're getting to the point of uh, understanding what the other world and the initiation and the living resurrection was all about. A very, very old tradition. So the Templars also came under the knife of the church, as we know, and uh, a lot of them escaped. And um, they basically said, you know, we're getting tired of being hunted to death. 
why don't we just go underground for a little bit, pretend that uh, we've all disappeared and gone uh, and died, and then we'll come back as Freemasons. And uh, about the time about of 1313, I believe, in Scotland, you have the first Masonic rite. Uh, a lot of people think that mis uh, Masonry only existed in the 18th century. It's very untrue, and uh, a real evidence will show, as the Scottish Rite Masons will agree, that the first uh, Masonic ritual actually took place in Scotland uh, under Mount Shahelion, if you want to the exact location, uh, in 1313. Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, times come and go. Uh, they, depending on who's on the throne uh, uh, in the Vatican, they can't come in and out of the woodwork, and then they recall themselves as Rosicrucians uh, and... Uh, they, they take on different mantles to sort of survive and live another day. Um, Francis Bacon would have been another member of uh, that illustrious brotherhood as well. So, yes, uh, I think Scottish Rite Masonry, above all other Masonic institutions, still holds the essential component of um, the original initiation ceremony of the Living Resurrection. And um, it's no surprise and no secret that the third degree of uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry actually shows an initiate blindfolded on the ground being lifted from a figurative grave and declared risen from the dead at that moment and the blindfold is removed because this initiative has been given uh, is privy to special information and now he can see so you see how the metaphors are still applicable today in Scottish Rite Masonry as they were 6,000 years ago now, I know you're stationed in, uh, or in Portland, Maine I'm here on the other side of the coast before we talked about how people can visit secret chambers in Egypt right now, or supposedly some of the pyramids were, were used as. Are there any locations in the USA? There, uh, the one thing that links secret chambers and um, <laughs> the, the secret initiation <laughs> is basically uh, the fact that they were all located on hot spots of the Earth's geomagnetic field. All of the uh, pyramids, uh, chambers, mounds, all of these places mm. are sitting on locations where the Earth's geomagnetic field is a little bit different, and that allows you to have an out-of-body experience under the right conditions. So my advice is to follow the locations where, for example, Native Americans uh, honor quite well, and respect their tradition too, because, you know, uh, we, we should honor their traditions and make sure that uh, to get access to these places, you have the right permission. Now, I do know of certain um, sacred mountains in the south of California, which is, I think, Mount uh, Kuch uh, Kuchama is one of them. And uh, there's a local tribe, which I still believe has a few members today on the Mexico border, that uh, they still go up to the uh, uh, this, uh, restricted cave near the summit, uh, where they once found the bodies of uh, nine and a half foot tall giants, oddly enough. And uh, from as far as I can remember reading about their stories, they were also following a similar tradition where um, a, a boy or a, a, it was usually a boy, they don't describe the women ever being initiated in that culture. Um, they did, at a certain coming of age, go up on a vision quest into this cave and they would come back several days later having crossed to the other side and returned with valuable information. And it seems very, very similar to what I was reading about in Persia uh, 4,000 years earlier. So uh, that's one place in Southern California right now. Um, well, I'll be there tomorrow. The American people didn't build much. They basically found natural places on the earth where they could have this experience. So uh. I would put the native traditions and see what they were doing and where they were going and follow that. What's the next mystery from the mystery schools that you're going to investigate? I don't know. It seems to find me. Um, the, the secret to my next book is usually written in the last paragraph of my last book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I'd known this when I began writing. It would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> um, I'm not sure at the moment. I'm sort of looking at some old traditions from the Pacific. And I'm sort of hunting a missing civilization that was around before a great flood encompassed the Earth in 9703 BC. And I seem to have come across it suddenly in New Zealand, of which we don't know much about. But um, if you talk to the right people, it's all there. So I'm looking for a lost civilization and looking at, at this story uh, from a slightly different angle that has, that has been discussed by various people, um, including, you know, uh, Graham Hancock, uh, who's described a lot of the ancient um, catastrophe civilizations quite well. Tell us, uh, before I let you go, just tell people where they can catch you, because I know you're doing a bit of a tour schedule, and also how they can get more information about you and the book. Oh, the simple uh, point of uh, reference would be uh, my website, which is invisibletemple.com. So all the books are there, the DVDs are there, the tour schedule is there, and uh, if you want to shoot me an email about something at some point, 
I should be able to get back to you. I've already annoyed you enough, so I'll probably stop emailing you, though. But, uh, I've re- Freddie, I really appreciate your time. Uh, of course, this is leading researcher of alternative history, ancient knowledge, sacred sites, and the interaction between temples and consciousness. Freddie Silva of the book The Lost Art of Resurrection. Thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you, sir. Spiritual attunement up next with philosopher Jason Gregory. The Mind's Eye returns in a matter of moments.